Well, I once worked with the most pessimistic people I have ever met in my life. I was 16 years old and I was working in an Italian restaurant in Teaneck, New Jersey. Now, I know New Jersey people tend to be a little pessimistic, but these people were beyond what you would imagine. I was a lot younger than all the staff. I was a lot less drunk than the Albanian cooks in the kitchen. And we opened every night at the restaurant with the prayer, no one is coming. <laughs> But they did. They came. I have no idea why my parents let me work there. <laughs> Except that the tips were good for a high schooler. That was okay. I remember one moment that symbolized that spirit of pessimism that was in that place. I stopped at a table where someone was eating and the customer said to me, uh, the steak I'm eating is a little too rare. Can you take it back to the, the cook? I said, yeah, sure. Like, that's my job, right? I took the steak and I went into the kitchen and I handed it to the cook. And the cook said, he took the steak. I said, it's too rare. Can you cook it again? I left and I turned around. I went through that swinging door between the kitchen and the dining room, the kind with the little triangular window. And as I turned and went through the door, I heard a thump. And I turned back and saw the steak dripping down the window like that. You see, pessimism is the anticipation of the worst outcome. It's believing that nothing will ever be right. And that stake was a symbol of the pessimistic spirit in that place. I left that job and the crew behind and tried to recover my spirit. But it gave me a perspective about the reality and the duality of optimism and pessimism. Early on, I could locate in neither. See, I didn't grow up in a religious family or even a family that was overly optimistic, that said everything will be okay no matter what. We preferred a realistic view to see the challenges, to see the situation and the people before us and to name them as real. Now, I'm not the most optimistic person today. My wife says I'm a pessimist. I say I'm a realist. I think that spirit came through in my family. I like to observe the world, what I see, and name it. No doubt what we see in the world is a world of gloomy things these days. Outcomes to be concerned about, stakes too rare that will never be right. But I'm not a pessimist. I'm not the guy who on the tombstone writes, I told you I was sick. <laughs> Realism. It says, I see a situation, I see a person, I accept its condition, and now what? Now I know the problem with realism is that it can be a little less hopeful about the future. But I think that realism is actually the key to hope. You see, I think the real challenge in our lives is the blurring between the ideas of optimism and hope. They're different things. There's a distinction that matters. Optimism is that vaguely positive sentiment that gets spread indiscriminately over hardship. Optimism ignores the facts and tries to feel good anyway. Optimism says, cheer up, life is a, is a mind over matter affair. And it defies common sense. But hope, on the other hand, hope surveys the facts. It acknowledges them. It takes a realistic shot at them and then chooses to look past the circumstances to something larger. Hope hears the hardest questions and believes there must be an answer, even if it happens to be elusive at the moment. Hope doesn't try to just feel good. Although sometimes hope is in fact painful. But hope can be confident where optimism wavers. Hope is hard-earned. 
You can't get it if you keep your head in the sand and hope is always available to those who wrestle in the real world with pain and injustice and difficult realities. Now, I heard a preacher recently who argued against hope. Imagine that, a preacher in a church arguing against hope. He was in favor of realism and mindfulness. He said in so many words that hope is dead in our world. And he quoted a teacher of mine from seminary, a Buddhist who preached in her own way realism, saying it's tiring to be hopeful all the time. My teacher repeated so many times the sentiment in the quote the preacher said, which was this, the biggest gift, she said, the biggest gift you can give is to be absolutely present. And when you're worrying about whether you're hopeful or hopeless or pessimistic or optimistic, who cares? The main thing is that you're showing up, that you're here, and that you're finding ever more capacity to love this world because it will not be healed without that. That was what is going on. That is what is going on, she said, when we unleash our intelligence and our ingenuity and our solidarity for the healing of the world. I don't want to argue with my teacher. I agree with her. But I don't think that realism trades off with hope. I think hope is useful to us. It is to me. I left that sermon thinking... I agree with the preacher about a realistic, mindful presence being better than false optimism. But I left feeling less hopeful about the world than when I walked in. And I started to think about my own life in this regard. How I see my children struggling in the world to make sense of what they experience, to make sense of themselves and I can get pretty pessimistic. I probably should get a little more present. But I also need to be hopeful that they will grow up and be dignified adults someday, that these teenage years are not the only path to personality, (laughs) (laughs) that this community will help them understand the sensitivities of life and that love matters. And I see our nation divided and disparate and despairing, and I'm not that optimistic about us. I'm sure the elections will divide us more. That the spirit of the rhetoric we hear will do more violence. I'm not optimistic about the racial inequity that drives violence in our streets, in our cities. I don't think it's just going to all get better. But I'm hopeful that we can pull together. That somehow we will come to our senses. That the systems we have will pull us together, not pull us apart. That the change we need is going to come not out of civil unrest or hatred, but out of something bigger. Now, I heard a famous sermon story about hope I want to share with you. It's by a man named Tony Campolo. He's a redline Christian. Redline Christians believe in a Jesus that they can follow because of the things they can confirm what Jesus said, not all the things that are put on Jesus the character. And Tony Campolo tells the story of being in a preach-off. You know what a preach-off is? I don't either, but I think it's it's like a bunch of preachers who are trying to out-preach each other. And he was a young preacher and he got up and he preached what he thought was the best sermon he'd ever preached. And he went back and he sat down and the old preacher sitting next to him said, that was all right. Now watch this. (laughs) And the old preacher got up and he said, It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And he started talking about how there was Good Friday and then there was Easter Sunday. 
how Friday comes around every week and then there's Sunday. He said, they, Friday, they say you can't change things in this world, but Sunday's coming. Friday, they say a bunch of people in church can't change anything, but Sunday is coming, he said. It's Friday and they're saying a bunch of Unitarians can't do anything, that they don't believe in anything, but Sunday is coming. He didn't say that, but I just added that part. <laughs> Tony Campolo said he went on like this. He was exhausted. The preacher shouting, it's Friday. And the congregation yelled back. Right. It was a sermon on hope. Now, I know the Christian preacher was probably saying it's Friday because we live in this mundane world. We have to deal with all this pain and suffering. But the renewed world, the resurrected world will be coming. What I am saying. Is We are here and now. We are this world focused. We know all isn't right on Friday. That you had a tough week. That crazy people are in the news saying abusive things. That there are wars and there are violence. But Sunday's coming. And we are together. We are here. We see a peaceful world in this room here that we create that symbolizes more than we even know. We can take the long view of life that is both realistic and hopeful. We don't have to have plastic, make-believe answers about how it's all going to be better. And we don't have to be all about realism and just say what is and what is here. We symbolize a hope in the world, in this church. Campolo finished his talk when he said, are we individuals ready ready to say that we can change lives that we have a good news can we say that our primary citizenship is in a world that cares for all that can make compassion and love important yes he said the good news is here it's friday but sunday's coming I say this, that we are a church and a people of hope. That is, in part, why we are here. That is why we give to support this place of our time and our talent. I said to some church members this week, this has been an extraordinary year that in the last 12 months, so many good things have happened. That just in this last Nine months, a member of our church came to me and said, there's an evangelical associate minister whose house burned down. And we, a bunch of Unitarians and a bunch of Muslim folks from the Richardson Mosque, are going to get together and collect some money and go help that evangelical minister. And that happens because of the program we created called Friends for Good, where Unitarians and evangelicals from Trinity Fellowship and the Richardson Mosque folks came together and deliberately talked about difference and created friendships. And you helped make that happen whether you were there or not because of what you give and what you believe about this place. And I said so many other things have happened. We had a teenager come out as transgender, meaning that he said, I am not the gender I was born with and I need your love to the teenage group here in church and they came around that teenager and embraced that person and said you are loved and you did that and your senior minister was asked to plan the response to the shootings downtown in Dallas and your associate minister was asked to join the mayor's council here in the city to make our city a better place. And your minister of congregational life was asked to be at the core of how we lift up Unitarian Universalist women's voices. And you did that. And this just this past week at our Women's Alliance meeting, we sang happy birthday to a 90-year-old woman who said to me afterward, that was the best birthday I've ever had in 90 years. <laughs> because all my friends are here singing to me and loving me.
and you did that because our collective power comes together and makes this place so many things. Our hope and our presence together and our gifts make all these things possible through our actions and our presence here. It made me think about Parker Palmer's statement about hope when he said the enemy of hope is abstraction. That if we evaluate our troubled globe from 30,000 feet as a viewer instead of a participant, it's almost impossible than to be daunted. But if we engage with our neighbors, if we use our local institutions as points of contact instead of receptacles of complaint, that intangible other begins to decay and we create hope in our midst. You see, you are part of my hope, my friends. And you are not an abstraction. You are a vibrant church that stands for so much in Dallas, that shows up in justice work, that cares for elders, that welcomes babies, that embraces trans teens, that visits and sings to the dying, that hosts conversations on race and racial inequity, that joins with Muslims and evangelicals in Dallas, Texas, to help minister to one another. You are a hope. That we can do all this with the freedoms we have, with the privileges that we acknowledge, with the chance to enliven love in our city. I am hopeful every day because of you. Because I know together we unleash our intelligence and our ingenuity and our solidarity for the healing of the world. I know that we help communities be less divided because... We don't get roped into divisive speech. We don't demonize people who disagree with us. Rather, we stand together for inclusion and love. I know hope because of you. And I know when you leave this sanctuary and go back to Monday and Tuesday and all the days including Friday that you symbolize a greater hope that knows the words it's Friday but Sunday is coming. My hope is like the farmer in the poem that Beth read today who plants the seed and feels the current of the past. Those who planted before him and made his life possible and also knows the ones coming after him. All our hopes are symbolized in part by our showing up and by the gifts we share with each other and by what we give to this church to make it what it is. We give because this church aims to save lives, not save souls. To save lives by being the most genuinely inclusive, joyfully deep, rational place of religion it can be. We give because our lives depend on it. The life of the church is made possible by you and no one else. And to be as generous as we can be helps us live more fully into our commitments, not only here but in our daily routines. We give because what we get back from church goes way beyond what happens here in this hour in the sanctuary and it goes way beyond what happens in the care of our children. What we get back is a more tolerant, rational, joyful world because of the existence of this place. We give because giving to this church makes a difference in the life of this city. Someone gave a testimonial some years ago and stood in this pulpit and said, imagine this church not here at all. Just wipe it right off the corner of Normandy and Preston. What does Dallas look like then? What we imagine in that moment is the reason we keep this church vibrant through our generosity. Why it is a beacon of hope. And today we get to act on that hope. You, friends, are why I give half of all the contributions I give away to organizations to this church. 
you pay me to be your senior minister. And when I give out away to organizations in the world, I give half of all those back to this church. Because I believe so strongly in what happens here. Because I believe in that symbol of hope, the mission that drives the commitments of each of us into the world. Because I come here and I know something. I know that in those words there is truth. That when it's Friday, Sunday is coming. And we together build that future. So whether you are a pessimist or an optimist or a realist, I hope you also of hope that is kindled here by the fire of our commitments and the fire of our mission.